Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Good morning to everyone. Actually, good afternoon, but it still feels like the morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank uh, Thierry de Montbriard for the invitation. Future of trade, it's a very large subject, of course, so uh, I would like to make comments on three, uh, really, areas or three forces that I think uh, will shape the uh, future of trade. Uh, of course, there's a certainty in what I will say, which uh, should not uh, be there at all. Uh, the first uh, area is, it rejoins really what was said in the last panel on artificial intelligence, and in particular by uh, Masoud uh, Ahmed, uh, and that is that I think the, that advanced manufacturing technologies are going to radically alter the nature of trade relations in the future. Uh, I'll take what he said and put it in a, uh, in a trade context. I think if you go back to the Uruguay round, and that is the multilateral framework that we have at the moment, uh, one way of looking at that round is that the basic deal underneath it was that the developed countries would uh, give more uh, increased access to their markets with the consequence that jobs in low technology, labor intensive industries would be offshored. And in return for that, the developing countries would protect the conceptual input to production, namely intellectual property. And that I think shepherded, it was not the only reason, but it shepherded this enormous growth in global value chains that we've seen, uh, particularly in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, and if you look at those global value chains, arguably the greatest value lies in the pre-manufacturing and the post-manufacturing, that is in the design and conception and research and development, uh, and in the marketing, branding and distribution and not in the manufacture. Now with uh, advanced uh, manufacturing technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, sensors, uh, and um, additive manufacturing, uh, I think that we're seeing the possibility uh, of the recapturing of manufacturing by industrialized countries. Uh, the example was given of Adidas, where uh, Adidas will have the capacity to be able to manufacture instead of using, using factories in Indonesia or Vietnam or the Philippines. That, um, I think, uh, that possibility, technological possibility, is joined by a political will, which we are seeing expressed, either to recapture manufacturing, and I don't think I'm not talking here about the Trump administration because I think the Trump administration is more old economy and not new economy. And when he talks about recapturing manufacturing, I think he's talking about traditional manufacturing and not new manufacturing. Uh, but we see a very, uh, I think, um, um, deliberate view that actually one of the reasons for recapturing manufacturing is because innovation follows manufacturing. Uh, and that is a good reason to preserve manufacturing capacity. Uh, I think we see that also in the case of China very much uh, with its strategy on artificial intelligence, its strategy on manufacturing. Uh, in this case, it's not uh, recapturing manufacturing, but preserving manufacturing. And this, of course, is going to uh, have a radical effect, I think, on the nature of trade relations uh, in the future. Uh, and I'm not sure it's being uh, addressed. Uh, it, of course, uh, means that there will be increased in pressure on, uh, pressure on intellectual property. That pressure was all, already there for the pre-manufacturing and the post-manufacturing because you're talking about patents and designs and branding, uh, but it will also uh, carry over, I think, into manufacturing in the future, uh, and this will be a major political issue. The second uh, force that uh, I would refer to uh, really is the whole digital economy um, uh, of which uh, the digitization of production of which I just spoke is only one part, but the whole digital economy and in particular data. Now it was said in the last session that algorithms are really the most important thing and that uh, they are certainly important, but I think algorithms are nothing without data uh, and data is uh, the, I would say, suggest 
the oil of the new economy. Uh, there is increasing value in data, both in the conception stage, in new business models for distribution, right across the production process. And it's created the behemoths uh, with which we're all familiar. Google, Facebook, eBay, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, and so forth. And I think if you look around the world now, uh, you see that governments are struggling to know how to deal with both data and the enormous enterprises that are built on the basis of data. There is a confluence of policy approaches that come into question. Uh, you have privacy, security, uh, data location, taxation, competition, ownership, uh, let's not forget, and trade all as perspectives. And I think one of the characteristics of the data economy is that it doesn't respect, of course, the architecture that has been put in place for trade relations in the past. And I don't see this really being addressed. I know the WTO is addressing e-commerce, uh, but I think, if I may say, it's a larger issue. Uh, and we are all struggling with policy approaches to uh, data. Uh, that really requires, I think, a fundamental rethinking of the system. Uh, and I fear that we no longer, or we do not have at the moment, the capacity to undertake that fundamental rethinking. And we don't have that capacity because, first of all, it concerns competitive relations which are becoming more and more difficult. Secondly, internationally, the, the asymmetries in technological capacity are simply enormous, and that creates a difficulty in being able to address questions. And thirdly, and I think perhaps most importantly, the speed of the development of technology these days is such uh, that it far outstrips our institutional capacity to respond. And this is true at the national level, and it's even more true when you come to the international level. So then let me just make my final point, uh, which is that I think there will also be in the future a new model of trade relations, or it's uh, actually in the present, that is being pioneered by China. So we've spoken a lot in the course of the conference about the vacuum that is being left by the uh, uh, policies of the current Trump uh, administration, uh, but, and that that vacuum is creating an opportunity for many countries, and in particular China, to move into the space. But I don't think that, uh, if I may say, uh, that China will move into the space in the same way, or with the same model of trade relations. And in this respect, I would uh, invite you to consider, for example, the difference between the Trans-Pacific Partnership as one model and the Belt and Road Initiative as another model. Uh, very shortly, I think, the difference of the model is infrastructure as against accords or agreements. And I think it's broader than change. Uh, trade, it applies also to development. Uh, so, uh, if you like in caricature, the old model is here are the rules, comply, and the new model is here is the road, trade. Uh, and I think this is going to have major institutional uh, or consequences for the institutional architecture. I would not wish to be thought to be suggesting by that that China is not a fully engaged member of the current multilateral system. It is absolutely fully engaged, but the model uh, for the future may be slightly different. Thank you.